Good morning, church. Oh, I like the sound. <laughs> uh, welcome to First United Methodist Church. It is uh, almost time for worship. Let us prepare our hearts in prayer and in devotional listening to the prelude. That is how we say welcome to First United Methodist Church in Barta. <laughs> that is how, how God welcomes us into God's house with joy, with music, trying to get us into the spirit of worship and prayer and connection with God. Hallelujah. Well, we have guests in the house today. Um, Mrs. Mosher brought friends from uh, uh, Fort Meade and uh, friends from a long time ago, I understand, uh, that will um, help her sing today. We welcome both of you to our church. And uh, I think I see Miss Kelly there in, uh, for the first time. Wow, welcome. She got her, her second shot. Uh, and, uh, and you're here. We are so happy you're here. Uh, we're glad to see everybody. Sherry Lingle is there. And uh, we're glad to see you. Uh, we're, we're happy to see everybody in the house today. Uh, Carolyn Presnell is there too. And um, she uh, has a beautiful testimony to share. Not today, but I'm hoping that one day uh, she will come and share uh, the testimony of how she has experienced the healing power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And I don't know what is better. They're probably both equally good to feel the healing power of God, but also to feel the love of God caring for you, the love of God caring for you as you are going through difficult times. So uh, we gather together as, as God's chosen people, God's loved people. Jesus died on the cross to, for our salvation, and we thank God for salvation, and we uh, come to worship God for what God has done for us. 
A uh, couple of announcements. Um, Bonnie would want me to say that this Wednesday at five? Seven. Seven, seven okay. This Wednesday at 7 p.m., uh, she's going to begin a choir rehearsal for those who, of you who are brave, maybe those of you who have been vaccinated, or those of you who are brave and you want to come. We are still, um, I, am, I apologize that we still have to put up with these things. I hate them. But they are necessary. <laughs> there is COVID still going around. We still hear of brothers and sisters, friends, sometimes members of our church that um, have gone through COVID just recently and maybe who are going through COVID now. So these things are necessary. Um, and uh, one day I promise you we will be able to get rid of them. But so far it's just a, minus, a minor uh, burden to carry for us to be safer. Uh, we're not crazy about it, so if you don't have one, we're not gonna exclude you from church. We have some available there. Uh, when we're in the altar, uh, obviously when we're talking, we don't need to use them, but we, we just try to be as careful as, as we can for the health of the congregation. Um, so choir is back. If you want to join, it might be a small choir, but and, and the room is big enough for us to separate as we are rehearsing. So you, you're, you're welcome to come to choir and uh, sing. Um, the announcements of the, of the week are as usual. We have prayer tomorrow at 10 a.m. We cannot overemphasize how important prayer is. If you cannot join us through Zoom, just take a minute and be in communion with God. And then on Wednesday, we will continue our Bible studies now on the letter of Paul to the Colossians. It is a highly important letter for today. It is written for today. And I will say more about it during the sermon. Uh, just want you to invite to be part of this activity. This Bible study will be on Zoom at 7 p.m. Uh, excuse me, on, uh, it will be on Facebook. It will be on Facebook on our church page at 7 p.m. This is the day that the Lord has made let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's pray. God, we thank you for gathering us as your people, as a holy people. You called us, you chose us out of all the nations of the world to make one new nation that is called by the name of Jesus. We come together to worship you, God. Help us to connect with you. Help us to be forgiven and to be empowered to live our Christian life in a way that pleases you. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. If you will stand and please join us as we call to worship together. Your part will be in yellow, congregation. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell the glory of your kingdom. And speak of your might. So that all people may know of your mighty acts. And the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. Amen. All he does. Remain standing as we sing our first hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. <laughs>
Thank you. You may be seated. If the, can I call the children? Yeah. If the children will come forward. Miss, all of a sudden, your brain left me. Miss Caitlin will come and lead you. Hey guys, good morning. Yeah, you remember my hair was red? I, I change it a lot. All right, I'm gonna come down here with you guys. Come on. Hey, we're down here. That's fine. You guys sit. All right. So, raise your hand if you've ever been camping. Anybody? Okay, a couple people. Did you get to sit around a fire and tell stories? No, you didn't. I know. When I used to go camping, when I was a Girl Scout, you did tell stories? My stories. Your stories? My stories. Uh, nice. Well, when I was younger and I went to Girl Scouts, we would sit around a campfire and we would tell scary stories, ghosty stories. <laughs> yeah, ghosty stories. And most of them, they were just silly ghosty stories. They weren't going to be anything super scary, but... Some of them were a little spooky, and I had to remind myself that God is always with me, and God is bigger than the boogeyman. God is with us, even when we're scared. And even though we know that ghosts aren't necessarily real, or we, nothing can hurt us because God is protecting us, did you know that people used to believe in ghosts? Even a long time ago in the Bible, when Jesus died and he was resurrected, he came to visit some of his disciples, and they thought he was a ghost. But then they realized it was Jesus. He was really, really with them. And that's why we had Easter not too long ago, because Jesus, what happened? What did Jesus do? What happened on Easter? Some of you know this. My child. Jesus rose. Thank you. <laughs> it would look bad if my own kid couldn't know the answers. <laughs> so Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah. <laughs> and that is why we celebrate, because Jesus overpowered death. There's nothing for us to be afraid of, because with Jesus, we don't have to be afraid of death. We don't have to be afraid of anything, because he's there with us. <laughs> will you guys pray with me? Hey, will you guys say a prayer with me? Come here. I want to pray. Dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much for being our courage and our strength so that we have nothing to fear because you are here. I pray, bless these beautiful, beautiful children and their energy and their love, and let it shine through them and radiate to some of us. In your name we pray, amen. Um, when Bonnie asked me to sing a while back, um, I'm not one that wants to sing solos. So I mentioned to her that I had a friend that I used to sing a lot of duets with, and uh, um, so she asked me if my friend would come and sing a duet with me. Gail and I first sang our first duet together about 51 years ago, uh, when her mother asked us to sing in her home church. When we were there for a visit. And for many years we did continue to sing together and now time has changed and we don't get to sing much anymore <laughs> together. But she was gracious enough to come up from Sarasota today to, uh, to sing with us, so. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sweet voice 
Thank you for sharing that this morning. That was beautiful. Yeah. My mic, on the other hand, not quite so beautiful. I encourage you to stand and praise with us this morning as we sing at Calvary. We always like to joke when it's just guys in the band, we turn into Deuteronomy. Your pardon multiplied 
testify to me. They're my burden, so found liberty and Calvary. Calvary. Our scripture this morning makes a mention of Christ's afflictions, and I think of myself both the very physical stripes and scars that he bore before Easter, and then the metaphorical scars that he bore for us for his resurrection. And this entire song is about the idea that Christ freed us from those chains of affliction. Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And twas grace and taught. fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that is kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, 
which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The word of God for the people of God. Today, you have seen our church embellished by some beautiful flowers here, and you might say, well, that is different. Maybe the camera can up there can capture them. And uh, you might be wondering, why do we have special flowers here? I promise you, they are not for the pastor. They are actually in honor of another pastor who has been our pastor for uh, quite a while. Uh, Reverend Chuck Weaver and Barbara Weaver, and this camera, if you can, um, Amy change, I mean, Ali, <laughs> sorry, uh, change to the other camera, uh, we'll show them. We uh, have decided to honor them and recognize them today because they are moving to Vero Beach. Uh, they're going to be closer to one of their sons there, and uh, we will miss them. So our church has a little present for them is, these flowers after the service are going to go with you. I'm going to take them to the car with you. And uh, we have a card that uh, somebody has it in the church. Where is it? Where is the card? At the end. Okay, here it is. <laughs> and uh, uh, you can sign it right after the service. And um, just keep it, keep it there. So I, I want to come here and say a prayer for you. This is just a thank you for Barbara and for yourself. Uh, uh, we, um, uh, we acknowledge them. They have been, um, they have, Chuck has been a mentor for me and uh, they have been friends of this congregation without charging any money. Every time he has preached here, I told them, hey, there is a check for you and he says, don't even send it. <laughs> Do you wanna say anything? Well, we are so glad uh, to have been introduced to the Bartow Church and community. You know, we lived on the south side of Lakeland for about 15, 16 years, and Bartow was just really a geographical location. It was a place to pass through on our way somewhere else, to Sebring, our hometown, or to Vero Beach, where uh, our oldest son lives. But uh, when I was asked to serve the church for four and a half months just prior to Armando coming, um, we found out that there was really a wonderful community here and, and um, a wonderful church. And we feel very attached now, uh, not just to the church, but to the community itself. And we thank you all so much for making us a part of your church family. Uh, it has really meant a lot to us. And uh, uh, you probably will, have, will not have seen the last of us today. We're not that far away, and, and we may just uh, come back after we get settled and uh, maybe uh, spend a weekend or something here and get to see you again. And so thank you, Armando. And uh, that was a, an act of faith, getting flowers for someone you weren't quite sure would be here today. <laughs> we never know. If you wouldn't be here, I will drive to your home and deliver them. Uh, but let's say a prayer for them. Dear God, Barbara, with her sweet spirit and her friendship and her uh, intelligence and uh, chalk, with her uh, um, spiritual wisdom and the humility and um, assertiveness, they have been your faithful servants, and we thank you that they have been close to us doing ministry here. We pray that their move to Vero, uh, Vero Beach will be smooth, no accidents, that you will help them get settled in their, in their new home. 
And I pray God because I know that there is a still there is still a long ministry for Barbara and Chuck, and I pray that you will continue to inspire them and guide them. There is so much that our church can receive from them in this uh, world. Uh, uh, I pray that you will continue to inspire him and to use him to your glory and to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of this world. We commend them, God, to your grace and your power. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you. All right. Heath, thank you for reading the scriptures from Colossians chapter 1, verses 25, 24 through 27. We're going to live within Colossians. We're going to move to West Turkey. Uh, it sounds more appealing than, it, it is more appealing than it sounds. <laughs> it's a beautiful area, and uh, we're going to be living with the Colossians for the next few weeks. Uh, there is a lot that we need to learn from this letter. I think this is a letter for today, as the whole Word of God is. This Word of God for today. There are so many uh, questions that we have today that Colossians can answer. But first, let's, let's bow our heads and pray. God, uh, nurture us. There are so many voices around, and we need to be in tune with your voice. In your name we pray. Amen. If we were to characterize the culture in which we live today in an approximate way, of course there are many things that distinguish our North American culture or the Western culture. But we would say that one of them is that we live in a culture in which personal, individual freedom is emphasized. Now that is great, that is awesome, except that sometimes it becomes also a culture of entitlement in which the individual might think that we can do whatever we want and get away with it. So we live in an I culture, defined by some of the equipments that we use, iPhone, iPad, iPod, iWatch, i. Um, sometimes it can become a, a me culture in which my needs can trample over, trample over everything else around us. If I w would give an example of what is going on is that sometimes uh, those of you who have children or grandchildren you might ask your kids, where do you, where do you want to eat? Where do we go? And I have heard that some parents or grandparents have to take a tour to different places in town. One child wants to eat something from McDonald's. The other one wants to go to Burger King or Pizza Hut or whatever. And, and the family ends up just going to different places just to satisfy the needs of each individual. Now, you can see where that my leaders, you, you can see the, the, the problem that could occur there. The sense of community might be spoiled. Uh, so how do we keep all of those things in balance, the community and the individual? Um, I, I love, I love, and we all do when Thanksgiving comes and throughout the year, we love to sit at the table together and say a prayer to God and all of us either bowing our heads or if you want to open your eyes, that's also fine. Uh, you see how, how we customize everything to the individual. <laughs> but some people feel the presence of God with their eyes open. That's, that's good as long as we are all connected to, to God and, and we come together under one God and under one Savior. Jesus Christ. So the letter to the Colossians, one of the problems that Paul was dealing with was precisely um, philosophies and cultures and ideas that are traveling around and becoming popular. 
to what degree can they dictate our Christian beliefs? One of the philosophers that has influenced Western culture the most, his name is Immanuel Kant. He lived in the 18th century, uh, and he developed an idea of moral autonomy. The individual should be free. It has been described as something like this. Instead of being obedient to an externally imposed law of religious precepts, one should be obedient to one's own self-imposed law. Now, you can see all the problems that that could lead to. It's, uh, I am, to clarify, I'm not throwing away everything that Immanuel Kant said and his philosophy. He has many good points. But you, you can say how, you can see very well how this can be out of balance. The equilibrium between moral law and divine law given to us by God. You can, you can see how, how that can be just thrown away if we only emphasize the rights of and the ideas of the individual. I wonder what Immanuel Kant would say, or any of us would say, growing up in the culture of today, if you really pay attention to what Paul is saying here. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. If we really look at, at what he is saying, uh, just think about in today's cultures in, in which everything is customized to make you feel good, to give you personal pleasure. Now, read this in that context. Now I, says Paul, I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. <laughs> Joy coming from suffering? You got to be crazy, Paul. Well, that's what he said. And that's, that's, this is not the only place in the Bible where we, where we can find that. Let me continue. I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now, if I read this correctly, if my mind is not somewhere else, what I find is that Paul is putting himself second, and God and his service to the church comes first. And if I am not remembering wrong, the first two commandments that Jesus gave us say, love God above everything else. So that priority is clearly established there. Love God above everything else. And then Jesus might be someone who talks out of it the 20th or 21st century, this is really good when, when Jesus says, and then love your neighbor as you love thyself. So you see how drastic that is and how important? Uh, it doesn't say love your neighbor above yourself. It doesn't say love your neighbor, put the needs of others below yours. It just says if you can just put your neighbor in the same plane as you are, and we are all equal, created by God as brothers and sisters, potentially as citizens of heaven. So in the Bible, it is clear that um, joy doesn't come from me, 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 or I, 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 I culture. We are created by God with a purpose that is outside of us. Now, don't get me wrong. There is joy in that. Paul said, that is, where, that is where I find my joy. When you put yourself second in regards to God and everybody else as equal as you, we're not giving up anything that will destroy us. We're, I'm not going to lose my identity. That's a word that we hear a lot today. I'm not going to lose my identity, my personal identity. 
If I put God first, and if I put everybody else as equal as, as me, that, that is actually when I am in the right place in this world, when I am connected in the right way to God and to others and to nature, that is where pleasure comes. That is where, G where real joy comes, when we have that equilibrium that, as a matter of fact, is, is broken in so many cultures. And we, in the Western cultures, we, we have a lot to contribute. And we do. I would not have to be born, I would not have enjoyed if I was born in a different culture uh, where my parents will choose my wife for me. Now, I will, I'm going to tell you a little secret about Isel and I. When we both began dating, are you ready for some graphic? No. <laughs> when, we, when we began dating, I went to my parents and I talked to them. Uh, my parents were leaving guess where? Does anybody know? Right here in Bartow. My parents were living here in Bartow, so I, I was living in Chicago and Isel was living in Lakeland. So I came to visit with my parents, but I guess there was an excuse. I wanted also to reconnect with her. And when things began to warm up, I, I talked to my parents and I said, Dad and my mom, how does this sound to you? Is it okay to you? Isel did the same thing. She went to her parents and talked to them. Because my parents and her parents have known each other forever, and we have known each other forever. Not forever, but we were very young when we met. So what is, is there anything wrong in seeking counsel and advice and talking to other people? So you see where we put our individual desires and our passions and under the consultation and the mentorship and the leadership of other people who have my best interest in their, in their mind. Well, um, my parents and Isel's parents, they were very happy. <laughs> I guess Isel was doing her job. She was getting close to my parents and trying to earn their favor because she had her eyes set on me. <laughs> I'm just teasing her. But, uh, but, you know, there is nothing wrong with that. You know, there is nothing wrong with... And just trying to twist your, everybody's arm into just doing your will, there's nothing wrong in talking and, and, and seeking God's counsel and God's will. Is this really the will of God for me? Can we ask that question before we ask the other question, this is what I want or not? If this is what I want, I'm going to do it. Not only there is no thing wrong with thinking, seeking God's will, but also it is the best and the wisest thing to do, to seek for, for God's approval and, and to ask others about uh, what, 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 uh, what, do you th what do you think is best for me? Now, the, the letter to the Colossians, and this is what makes it so critical and so important for us, was written at a time in which contemporary philosophies and religious ideas of that uh, era, first century, were beginning to influence the church and creep into the mindset and the theology and the doctrine and the practices of the church. And uh, the apostles had to put a stop to it. And uh, later on in the second century Christianity, these philosophies and these religious ideas, they were combined. There was a kind of syncretism, that word, that word means a combination of ideas that were becoming popular and powerful, even though they were simply wrong. You know, what sounds attractive at first sight is not, some, it's not always necessarily what is best for us. And that's where checks and balances come into play. So when you read chapter 2 in the letter to the Colossians, and, and that was my Bible study, just a little introduction last Wednesday. You can go back and watch it on Facebook. Chapter 2 is a whole chapter top to bottom 
in which Paul is turning on the warning sign. And he uses some language there. Attractive arguments, Paul says. Philosophies of this time. Religious, even religious ideas that were around him. And when they get together, they created a soup that was not precisely the soup that the church should drink. <laughs> and, uh, and that's where first Colossians, um, excuse me, Colossians came about. Uh, a letter in which Paul wants to call us to our, to the truth and to a firm foundation so that the winds and the trends of this world, which come and go, they change. The trends that were alive and influential when I went to seminary and to the university uh, for the second and the third time, uh, 20 years ago when I was in Evanston, Illinois, and then in uh, Rogers Park, Illinois, those are not the philosophies and the ideas that are current today. So they change. They change. How are we going to build our life? What is the foundation that we are going to use to determine rules of conduct, rules of worship, rules of for our even for our intimacy, for our life. Where where do they where do those come from? The reference of all of those philosophies, as I said, is not chapter one in Colossians. It's actually chapter two. Actually chapter two. In chapter 1, what Paul does in this letter is to remind us of the foundation, what comes first. And you know what comes first. You know where is the rock upon which we should build our house. That rock is Jesus Christ. So Colossians is, is a beautiful letter. It's a passionate letter. I, um, I talked to it with the... the, the phrase that might be new for you, high Christology, meaning deep and high ideas about who Jesus is, in which Jesus is not only another man, another person. He was a person. He was a man. He became flesh. He became flesh. And thus, that's one of the things that Paul clarifies in Colossians. Jesus came in the flesh, but he's God. He's the creator of the universe. Paul says there, when you read uh, Colossians chapter 1, you think that you're reading the Gospel of John chapter 1 because they both go back to Genesis chapter 1 when, where we read, in the beginning, God created. And then in Colossians chapter 1, we read the same thing that we read in John chapter 1, and that is Jesus created, the Word of God, the Logos the creator, creating power, the ordering power of this world that put everything in place. God creating, creating out of chaos, creating order. Now, that might sound something that philosophy today doesn't like. Philosophy today emphasizes the importance of chaos. Chaos is good, they say. Because out of chaos came life. Yes, out of chaos came life because God was ordering things and putting things in place. Putting things in place so that the world can function and we, and, and we can, can function. So you go back and read chapter 1 in the letter to the Colossians and you will see nothing exists outside of Jesus Christ. Everything that is here, everything that we see, everything that we feel, and every good idea, the truth, every truth that we hold on to, it comes from God. That's chapter one. Chapter two, I invite you to uh, listen to my Bible study in two weeks. This week I'm going to stay in chapter one in the Bible study because I think it is important that we focus on God and on Jesus Christ. As I said, 
the reference to the philosophies, they were, Paul didn't begin talking about that in chapter 1. He first says, this is our foundation, Christ. And then in chapter 2, there are many philosophies. We don't know exactly what those were, but we can try to, and find out what are the ideas that are misguided today that could separate us from Jesus. And that's something we can do. Maybe we cannot find exactly the world thought of the world uh, in the uh, first century, but we can look around today and you can read the newspaper and you can turn on the TV and ask this question. What I see or what I read, is this pleasing to God? Is this based upon the rock that has been established as the foundation for the universe? When we do that, what we learn in chapter 1, again, G, uh, uh, Paul says, I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. <clears throat> and I will fill up in my flesh. See the importance of the body. The body is important. I will fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. <clears throat> Now, what, did that, what does that mean? That's a little bit, Paul, you were a little bit proud when you were saying that. Did you, did you actually read, did you hear what I said? Let me say it again. I will fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. That's a puzzle. What does that mean? Because... Paul could not do anything else to work out our salvation. So what is Paul talking about here? It's right there in the letter, and it's all over the place in the New Testament. It is in the Gospels when Jesus said, if anybody wants to be my follower, what do they have to do? Oh, it doesn't say join the I or the me culture. It says deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me, and follow me. So what Paul is saying here is not that he was going to die for the salvation of anybody. He could not do that. But he is willing to offer his life as a living sacrifice. That's something, that, something else from... Romans chapter two, 12. He, he can offer his life as a living sacrifice so that we can continue doing the work that Jesus started, proclaiming salvation in the name of Jesus, proclaiming the name of God, the good news, the gospel, the gospel. And that is when things turn a little iffy. Proclaiming the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ entails sacrifice, entails sometimes pain, suffering, affliction. And that is what Paul is talking about here. He's not going to die for our salvation, but he's going to die. He's willing to die so that the message of salvation, the message of Jesus Christ, the foundation finally reaches over the ends of the earth. And the whole universe is filled up with the knowledge of the salvation in Jesus Christ. So I want to read uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, because this is it's the same person, the same mindset of in Colossians. Paul says... I urge you, my brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, this is serious, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship, and do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world, 
but be transformed in the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect before God. So you see, he's establishing a difference between what the world, what this world tells me and what God tells me. We live in a world in which the trends of today have the priority, the primacy over what the Bible says. This is not how you and I learned Christianity. And I hate to say, but this is not going into the narrow road and the narrow door. This is not entering through the door that leads into eternity. So my brothers and sisters, I have good news and bad news for you. Which one do you want to hear first? The bad news. The bad news? The good news. Jesus loves you and you have eternity. We have eternity for us. We are special. We are chosen people. That's the good news. The second news is actually not bad. It's also good news. It entails sacrifice. Christian life entails sacrifice. And it's good news because Paul says that he rejoices in what he is suffering for everybody else. I have to tell you, I have a living example of what this means. And that's my father and my mother. Sometimes I am in pains for the life that my father lived. It bothers me that I have a lot of pleasures and joys in life that my dad did not have. I have traveled to, to Israel. There is nothing that my dad would desire more, desire more than go to Israel. If my, ha my, if my dad had $3,000 right now in his hand, and this is the way he lived, and the way he made my mother live through, <laughs> no, <laughs> the way my mother also lived through joyfully with him, with my father. If he had $3,000 now, and I would give him a choice, Come with me, I will take you to Israel. And at the same time, he has a choice to help somebody in need. My dad's choice in this world has always been to give to others. And then, and then I come upset and I tell, him, I tell him, but you have to do something for you. And he always tells me, that is precisely what I am doing for me. I have pleasure. I have joy in seeing how I can make a difference in other people's lives. And that is my joy and my pleasure. And I have to say, well, I give it up to you. That's why you are my father, not only biologically, but I, that's, why, that's why you have trained me and that's why I have become... Uh, uh, Pastor Roy Lowe told me one day, many years ago when I came here and I met Pastor Roy, when I was beginning to flirt with Isel, I met Pastor Roy here and he told me, if you could just be half as good as your father, you would be okay. <laughs> and I, that's what I try to be. I just try to be as half as good as my father. But I have to tell you, everything you do, Everything you do, and this is from Colossians. This is from Colossians. We will read it later on. Everything you do, if you do it for the Lord, it will be pleasing to God. Everything you do, do it in the name of the Lord. And that's what will give you joy and joy to those around you. There is no discrepancy. There is no false dichotomies. My joy and your joy, the joy of all of us, it's built together when it is built under God. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear God, we thank you for the examples that we have in the Bible and in our life and uh, people who have lived a life of sacrifice and at the same time, it has been a life of joy. 
Help us, God, to learn that joy in which I, our identity is not so much whatever I want to be or do, but our identity is primarily to be your children, sons and daughters of God, our Creator. Help us to find our identity, our life, our service, our death, and our resurrection in you, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our final anthem this morning tells us everyone needs compassion. Everyone needs love. I don't deserve it any more or any less than Bill or Tom or Brandon or Pastor Armando. We all are in need of love, not only from each other, but from God himself. I invite you to stand with us and sing Mighty to Save. Say a prayer. We cannot 
I cannot talk about these things that I have, we have been talking about and then go on with my life like if nothing has happened. This is serious. This is a war that we're battling and we do it in prayer. So let's bow our heads and pray. Dear God, we thank you for building your church upon the rock that will never be changed because that rock is eternal. It's the building block that the builders throw, threw away and they did not appreciate it and they killed him, Jesus, but you resurrected him and you have set him as the head of over every principality and every idea and every philosophy so that everything comes under you, God. So we pray for this world and for this nation. We pray for each and every one of our families. We pray for our children. We pray for the new generations. We pray, God, for the truth that is found in you. We pray, God, that we will be light in this world, uh, that we will reflect your truth into this world. We pray that, God, that you will rescue us from uh, those ideas and those principalities that are trying to destroy uh, your church and this country and this world. We know that we do not have a struggle against human beings or flesh, but against powers and principalities in the heavenly spheres. Satan trying to destroy what you have created. But we thank you, God, because Satan has been destroyed and, and uh, the, he has been defeated. And we thank you, God, for the children, God. And we thank you, God, for life in this world. And we thank you, God, that evil has been defeated in the cross. And now what you desire is for us to continue to build our lives upon that message and to proclaim the good news of salvation, Jesus. We offer our lives, as Paul said, as a living sacrifice so that you will use us to your glory and to your honor, God. God, we pray that you will Fill us, with, fill us up with the Holy Spirit to do that job. In your name we pray, amen. And I invite you to pray as we listen to the postlude.
at the cross, at the cross where I saw the light, and my sins were taken away right there. May the light of Christ guide us in all we do, and let's go into the world and be instruments of blessings for others. Amen.